that introduction. And thank you, James and Alexandra, the Elder, for inviting me here. And thank you all for coming. Thank you also to the Grand Hotel, which gave me a delicious lunch catering for my good <laughs> Gluten allergy, which my wife persists in thinking is a symptom of hypochondria. <laughs> um, it's around 50 years since I first spoke at a literary lunch, and that was a lunch given by the Yorkshire Post in Leeds for my first novel. And I can't remember the name of the other authors, but one of them was a show jumper. And well, I don't think it was <laughs> Anyway, after the, after the lunch, I sat down by my pile of books. And one nice lady came up and bought a copy, and she said, I so admired your clear round at the Yorkshire show. <laughs> I hope I'd be slightly better today. Um, but there are other anniversaries, um, I think it's about 10 years since um, we sat signing books at, at, at Hatchards. Um, Flora, I remember meeting as a 10-year-old girl in her parents' garden in um, Camden Hill Square. Here she is. At, an established author, mother of three. And then there's Alexander, the editor, who's been my close friend for over half a century. Um, and I'm very, anyway, great. I don't think it's just friendship that's brought him to invite me here today. Now, my novel Scarpia, the title is the name of its hero. And those of you who are familiar with Puccini's opera Tosca will feel that you know him already. Baron Scarpia is the villainous chief of police in Rome in 1800, hunting down idealistic young republicans who wish to overthrow the Pope. And in the opera, he's an outright villain, an out and out villain, but in my novel, he's not, and I should like to explain why. The opera is set in a very specific moment of history. After the revolution of 1789, the French invaded Italy and they set up republics in Rome and Naples. In 1799, they suffered a momentary series of defeats, and at the time of the opera, the French army was held up in Genoa. So the Bourbon king and queen of Naples had been restored to their throne, um, and their armies had occupied Rome and were awaiting the return of the newly elected Pope, Paris VII. Now many of the... Wait a minute. Many of the Neapolitan Republicans, after their defeat, had been imprisoned and executed by rather vengeful monarchs because Queen Maria Carolina of Naples was a sister of Marie, Marie Antoinette and wanted to take revenge for her sister's execution. But in Rome, the city had been surrendered on the condition that the French would retire in good order and the Republicans remain unpunished. But a number of Roman Republicans remained in the city and were planning to seize the city before the Pope returned. And it was Baron Scarpia who was charged with the task of thwarting this Republican coup. Now he already had some success. One of the Republican leaders, leaders Cesare Angelotti, had been arrested and was imprisoned in the Castel Sant'Angelo. But his friend, the painter Mario Caravadossi, had arranged his escape. And Caravadossi is arrested by Scarpia and tortured to reveal the hiding place of Angelotti. Caravadossi's mistress, the singer Floria Tosca, pleads with Scarpia, Scarpia barters with Tosca, his uh, sexual favors in exchange for Caravadossi's life. Now this is the plot of the opera, not my novel. The idea of writing a novel with Baron Scarpia as the hero came to me after reading a book by an American historian in which he convincingly established that the opera was based on bad history. The source of the libretto was a play written in the 19th century by a militant French atheist and fanatical Republican who was called Victoria Salvin, who projected his own prejudices back onto the late 18th century. Thus, in Salvin's play, and therefore in Puccini's opera, the Bourbon monarchs of Naples and above all the Pope are these cruel tyrants and the Republicans of the time are heroic champions of freedom and democracy. Scarpia must therefore be a villain. What this academic established, however, is that the Romans of the late 18th century were in fact particularly content to be subjects of the Pope, and so too were the Neapolitans and the Bourbons. I mean, in neither city was there anything resembling democracy, but in both 
and immerse it in sort of these gross disparities between rich and poor. But at the time, people, they weren't what we would call, um, what do you call it, aspirational. People felt that they were, God had given them a station into which they were born and they should more or less be content with it. And Goethe, for example, who travelled around Italy at that time, found that the Neapolitans were, were particularly cheerful, even though they were particularly poor. And Rome, as we learned from the histories, formed the most stable society in Europe at the time. It had been ruled by the popes for over a thousand years. And the reason for the contentment of the Romans was that huge sums of money poured into Rome from the universal church. So there existed a kind of welfare state. Uh, charities vied with one another to feed the poor. There were free soup kitchens, free schools, free hospitals, a model prison, and many free entertainments. And when the French finally occupied the city, they found that a population of around 100,000, um, one third of clergy, one third did very little work, and one third did no work at all. <laughs> It's therefore easy to see why they hated the French invaders who made them pay taxes and looted their treasures, taking them back to the newly opened Louvre Museum in, in Paris. And they also tried to replace the Catholic religion to which they were attached with worship of the God of Reason, with the anniversaries of church feast days were turned into anniversaries of Republican triumphs, and liberty trees were planted instead of crucifixes in public places. And those who protested were shot, and it's quite a brutal occupation. So they saw their own republicans as collaborators. And so Baron Scarpia, rather than being a kind of Klaus Buffy, the butcher of Lille, was really more like a leader of the resistance, of someone like Jean Moulin. And it is in this role that he appears fleetingly as a real life, as a real historical figure in a, pop, in a history of a popular uprising. Um, it's written by someone called Pietro Coletta, who was himself a republican. And although he acknowledges Scarpia's courage, he portrays him and all the leaders of this insurrection as monsters who were playing football with the heads of their victims and drinking blood out of their skulls. Now, with Garibaldi, you remember, he ousted the Bourbons and he conquered the Papal States as a prelude for the unification of Italy. And so it was this view that the Republicans were good guys and the Bourbons were the bad guys that has pre prevailed. And so Scarpia on the wrong side of history. What I do, or I try to do in my novel, is to create a Baron Scarpia based on good history. Uh, some of the characters are historical, some are hysterical, like those that appear in Puccini's opera, but many more are in fact invented by me. I've given him a life, which I hope is consistent with the times he lived in. Very fascinating times, which show these little Italian principalities suddenly hit by the ideas of the Enlightenment and the violence that came with the French Revolution. It's also the age of self-invented adventures, the exceptions to that rule I said about not being aspirational, such as Casanova, if anyone hasn't read his memoirs, I do recommend them, who reinvented himself as a chevalier de Saint-Gard and was made welcome by the current heads of Europe. And there's Emma Hamilton, who some of you will know from Cora's book, The Love in Heaven, the daughter of a blacksmith from Cheshire, who ends up as the wife of the British ambassador in Naples, the lover of Admiral Nelson, and the confidant of Queen Maria Carolina. And then there is Floria Tosca, whose story I tell in parallel with that of, Scar Tosca, of Scarpia, until their two lives intersect, first in Venice, then in Sicily, and finally fatally in Rome. As in Puccini's opera, She's a composite character based on a number of operatic divas. A peasant girl from the Veneto living in a convent and singing in the church choir. She is discovered by a bishop and fought over by a prince. When she reaches the stage and sings at Pascala, she enraptures her audience and forms an army of admirers who fight against their rivals. The Italians at the time were very reluctant to fight for liberty, equality, and fraternity or even the divine right of kings, but they die for the sake of their demons. Tosca has lovers, as did most actresses and singers at the time. There's one, Giuseppina Cassini, who had affairs with both Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington. Um, I was a little embarrassed to read in a review of 
by novel and spectator that there are more scenes of seduction in this novel than in any I've written before. Now, I haven't done my own tally, but if it's correct, it's only because I felt I had to be true to the times. When it came to Rome, the eternal city, I'd hoped to show how the morals of devout subjects of the Pope were corrupted by the French invaders. But to my mild dismay, I discovered that our own permissive society would have seemed positively prim to the Romans at the time. Girls were chaperoned until they married, but then they did more or less as they pleased. And if you would suggested to a Roman, wrote another historian of the period, that he loved one woman all the days of his life, he would have objected that you were removing a good part of his reason for living. <laughs> now I hope I've tried to give you a flavour of my novel. Um, the denouement of the opera and the denouement of the novel coincide, but that you get there from a very different direction. Like Flora, I greatly enjoyed doing the research, and I would hope very much that any of you who read it would enjoy it too. Thank you.